Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. So in the past I've uh, given updates on various clinical trials involving gene therapy for both um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy as, weather, as well as other types of muscular dystrophy. Uh, today I wanted to mix things up a little bit and talk about a clinical trial in one particular form of LGMD, uh, LGMD uh, 2i, uh, alternately LGMD R9, um, FKRP deficiency, which is currently happening. And it's not a gene therapy trial. It instead involves a what's called a small molecule, in this case a, a derivative of a certain uh, form of sugar. And so the trial is going on right now. Uh, I actually know people in the trial, but I'm not going to be reporting any results. And in fact, I've specifically uh, avoided asking uh, the people I know in the trial how they're doing. So here's the listing uh, for the clinical trial that's currently happening in LGMD2I. And uh, the title is Open Label Phase 2 Study of BBP418 in patients with LGMD2I. This is a listing in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, okay, uh, BBP418 is just a code number from the company developing it. Uh, what the um, compound that's actually been being studied is called uh, ribotol. And okay, what what is ribotol, and why are we um, why does someone think that this is a potential treatment for LGMD two I? Um, and in general, the um, the the story is um, kind of complicated. And the only reason that um, people ever thought of this is because we now understand a whole lot about. Um, what the protein called FKRP and 2I does and um, you know what the pathological mechanism of this disease is. Okay, so 2I is one of a number of types of uh, muscular dystrophy, including limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which is called a dystroglycanopathy. Okay, and what this means is that you have a protein uh, in the cell. Uh, this is a, a picture of it from a uh, review article uh, a number of years ago. And on this protein, uh, there's a bunch of sugar molecules. Uh, glycosylation is um, you know, a fancy word for saying uh, sticking sugar molecules onto proteins. And these sugar molecules help uh, this protein stick to other proteins which attach the muscle fiber to um, uh, structures uh, you know, on, called the basal lamina outside the muscle fiber, and that's necessary to stabilize it when uh, it contracts. So as an analogy, imagine that you're, you want to build a stone wall, and you have a bunch of people um, on the crew that's supposed to build the wall, but there's a few quirks about this stone wall. Uh, you have to use several different types of stones uh, in a very particular order. And each of the members of the crew building the wall has the job of putting one particular type of stone in one particular place in the wall. There's also some people who are uh, preparing the stones. Uh, some of them require preparation for them to be put in the wall. So the wall only gets built if everyone does their job correctly and if uh, there's the right types of stones uh, available when you need them. So that's kind of the way that uh, glycosylation works. Uh, 
only instead of stones, we have particular different chemical forms of sugar molecules. And instead of the work crew, eat, we have a bunch of enzymes, each of whom has a specific job to add a particular sugar molecule in a particular place in the glycosylation chain. Okay, so what is our um, stone wall made of sugar molecules actually look like? And this um, took many people many years to figure out. So uh, this is uh, alpha dystroglycan, and these are the arrangements of different sugars. Each of these abbreviations is for a different kind of sugar molecule. Uh, each of these um, words in blue is the name of a different enzyme whose job is to attach that specific sugar molecule to that specific place in the chain. And there's a type of muscular dystrophy associated with mutations in each one of these different enzymes. So here's FKRP here. And uh, what it does, I'll uh, expand the, uh, just this part. Okay, starts with a molecule called ribose, uh, which is a kind of sugar. It's uh, different from table sugar and different from glucose. Uh, it actually makes up the black backbone of uh, RNA and in a slightly different form, DNA. That gets converted to ribitol, which is the compound that's being tested in this clinical trial. Then that gets chemically modified further to put on phosphate. Uh, that gets uh, chemically modified yet again to put on another phosphate. And this, is, and this last step is done by an enzyme whose old name is ISPD, new name is CRPPA and there's a type of limb girdle muscular dystrophy associated with it, with mutations in that. Then this molecule gets put on to the chain twice, once by um, Fucatin, uh, and that's associated with LGMD2M, and then the second time by FKRP, which is associated with 2I. So, the idea is that in any of these um, muscular dystrophies, the enzyme isn't working very well. But we know that it's working to some extent because uh, basically if this pathway didn't work at all, uh, a person or for that matter a mouse um, couldn't be alive. So if you just give more ribitol uh, to a person, that'll increase the amount of all the molecules on this pathway and then increase the amount uh, that the this not very good version of the enzyme is able to stick onto this um, chain of sugar molecules on alpha dystroglycan. Okay, so that's the theory. Now, um, how did they test it before getting to the clinical trial? Um, okay, so um, these researchers made a mouse with um, LGMD2I. They gave the mouse a mutation in the FKRP gene and found that, okay, this had muscular, they had muscle weakness, it didn't have uh, good glycosylation of alpha dystroglycan. But then when they gave the mice ribitol, um, that improved the, uh, the glycosylation and it improved their muscle function. Okay, so that sounds like you have a, a good candidate for a drug. So, um, then they started developing the drug, um, you know, went through all the um, communications with the FDA to um, uh, work up a clinical trial, and then this clinical trial listing is the result. 
Okay, now um, I mentioned uh, in, in a couple of figures ago, um, ribose, um, you know, is on the pathway. Ribose you can just buy, and these people actually uh, reported, now they weren't testing it in mice, they were just testing it in cells with, um, that were taken from patients with LGMD2U, um, which is the um, enzyme that sticks the second phosphate onto ribitol uh, that then is assembled on the chain by Fucatin and FKRP. Uh, and they found that, you know, ribose, in addition to ribitol, um, can uh, restore the amount of this um, uh, ribitol diphosphate. Um, however, uh, you take, it takes about five times as much ribose uh, relative to ribitol. So that's, that sort of makes sense why ribitol would be the more promising drug candidate. Okay, so um, that's a, a list of you know these these three genes on the uh, glycosylation pathway that you know could potentially all be treated by ribitol. Um, okay, but it turns out um, there's you know a bunch of other gene, uh, genes on the pathway, and there's a bunch of other sugar molecules that they uh, deal with. Okay, can you treat other types of um, LGMD um, in, in the dystroglycanopathy category by, you know, giving a person, you know, more of that kind of sugar? Um, possibly. Uh, we don't actually know. Uh, and there's a couple um, hurdles in actually looking into that. Um, one is that um, most of these types of uh, MD are much rarer than um, LGMD2I, so it's much harder to actually study them. Um, the other thing is that some of these, um, you know, molecules, uh, the ones in red, uh, you can just buy. So there's not really much incentive for someone to develop them as a drug because people don't have to buy the drug from you. They can just, you know, order it online or buy it at the health food store. Okay, now, um, now that you've heard a little bit about this clinical trial, um, I thought I'd make a couple remarks uh, comparing it to gene therapy clinical trials. Um, so in one way, you can think of, you know, okay, just giving people um, a slight derivative of a certain form of sugar uh, sounds a whole lot easier than doing gene therapy on someone. Okay, and that's true. Uh, but uh, would anyone have ever thought that they should try Ripitol as a treatment for LGMD2I until all of this research, uh, uh, which explained all of the glycosylation pathway and exactly what FKRPs function in that, um, you know, there'd be no reason that, you know, you it would occur to anybody to try ribitol. And that's what's generally true of gene therapies versus other treatments. In gene therapy, um, you don't have to know what the protein that the gene makes actually does. You know, you just have to know, okay, it's apparently important for muscle cells because um, when you have a mutation in it, there you get a particular form of muscular dystrophy. So we just want to put it back in and it'll do whatever it does. We, we don't even know necessarily. Uh, but in theory, that should fix the problem. Um, however, if you are trying to do something, you know, like give a certain molecule to a um, to fix um, something, then you have to know exactly what the protein does, and then try and, and figure a workaround 
for you know what how you can make things better if it isn't doing its job very well. So that's kind of the contrast. Um, it's in some ways it's you know much easier to do a small molecule therapy like ribitol, but on the other hand, you need a whole lot more understanding of the disease process. And you know this um, this glycosylation chain of alpha dystroglycan involves you know something over 20 different enzymes, um, several different sugar molecules in a very particular order. It took a whole bunch of people many years to unravel this. And you know now we're just at the point where we can start thinking of you know specific treatments and begin testing them.